My name is Rick Winkler. I'm with a group called IMEC, or the Illinois Manufacturing Excellence Center. We're a part of the MEP system, which is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. It's, uh, each state has one of us in it. Um, I've personally been with IMEC for about uh, nine years now, with the Missouri version for about 13 years, and have been working in the continuous improvement side, or the lean manufacturing side, uh, since 1996. Went through some training initially with the MEP system on the Toyota production system. Certified in that and been working at it ever since. But a couple things before I get started here, I wanted to note uh, something Danny said earlier this morning, dealing with uh, not knowing the processes. Uh, you know, we, we're not intimate with it. And it's the same with us as, as we work through, and I would work through the uh, continuous improvement side of things, the lean manufacturing side of things. I would make no claim that I understand everything that you do intimately. I have an understanding of it, but what I am very good at is finding waste located around these processes and these operations. And this is what we will focus on. We take a look at where we see it and what, then we have some strategies to, uh, to try to get rid of and eliminate these wastes that we've got. Something Shantan who said also had to, it got me thinking again, and it, it, it's uh, a lot of what we do, it's a lot of common sense, quite frankly. And the people that I engage with, that our group engages with, we typically see them already doing some type of waste elimination in their processes. They just don't realize it. And they find it to be, once we give them a, a, a structure, a framework around which to build this on and, and, and add on, it, it starts to change the culture and improve things dramatically for them. And lastly, something Joe had said, which made me think it's, I, I, every time I walk into one of these uh, potential engagements, it's, buy me a million bucks. I said, quite frankly, I can't find a million bucks. And then in my 20 plus years of doing this, once we got real lucky and, uh, and came in with just over a million. But, I'll explain to my clients, my potential clients, I can find you ten, fifteen thousand dollars a whole lot of times over. And that just starts to add up over time. And I kind of relate that to the energy side of things. Is you find little things, you make little improvements, it all starts to add up over time. But they have to be disciplined and be diligent on making these changes and making these improvements. Anyway, so to get moving on here, defining lean. It's a systematic approach to identifying, eliminating waste or non-valued activities and processes, and trying to make change through continuously improving them. One thing about lean, again, it's lean manufacturing, it's been called for, uh, uh, since, the, since the inception of it, quite frankly, but we find more and more, and this is in the, the recent past, say the eight to 10 years from the past from now, or in the past, that we're seeing applications in uh, transactional environments or office environments. Uh, if you can picture in your operations, uh, uh, receiving an order all the way through the shipment of that order, how much waste is involved in just preparing paperwork to get that particular order out to get the, something made, to get something to the production floor. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity, not just in the manufacturing side, but in the office side also. Some of the central goals need to respond to customer requirements flexibly. Not just, we don't want to have to be jumping through hoops constantly. Products controlled to the customer orders. In other words, what the customer orders we make. You don't make a bunch of inventory, go let it sit in finished goods and sit there and wait. Maybe they're gonna do it. The food guys we got in here, hey, do you guys work in forecasts at all? Anybody even forecast, we think we're gonna need this, we think we're gonna need this based on the, some of our past usage. And how much is now still sitting in a freezer or a cooler or sitting in some dry storage someplace? And possibly ends up, I see a little smile up here. We got something going on there. But it ends up, at the end of the day, it turns out to be maybe it's uh, gonna go feed an animal someplace as it goes past an expiration. Focus on the efficiency of the value, uh, the value creation stream. What is this customer willing to pay for? That's what you wanna look at. Eliminate the non-valuated activities. These are the wastes around these uh, valuated ideas. Paste the product, uh, again, a consistent flow going through. They're not uh, try to get away from the, the herky-jerky of the ups and downs that you would have in typical uh, production processes. This is one I, I get hung up on, quite frankly. This maximizes employee responsibility. It's something I, I get a little passionate about with the people that I deal with. So I feel like it's very, very important that you use the knowledge, the skills, the abilities of the people that you've got working for you. Um, I was looking around this room and, and not knowing it, I know a few people in here from working with them, but just the years of experience sitting in here, and I'm guessing, uh, conservatively, there's probably 500 plus years of experience sitting just in this room alone. And that knowledge, that experience, and the abilities that sit in this room are just amazing. It's powerful. You need to draw on that. That's why we talk about maximizing the employee responsibility. Use this information that these people have. Use the knowledge that they have as you try to make improvements. Then finally, you need to nurture a, this environment of continuous improvement. This is something uh, 
it's not a one-off project, it's not a one-time, we're gonna do it for one day or so and then we're gonna quit. It becomes a change in the way you do something. And it needs to be nurtured up front to where it finally becomes, this is the way we've always done it. I'm sure everybody's walked into a place and why do you do it this way? It's how we've always done it, guys. It's just the way it's been. We see this continuous improvement, this environment to nurture this. When you come in six, eight, 12 months later, and you see that the change is happening. This is how we've always done it. We know the change is happening. They're a good change for the positive. Lean focuses on the elimination of waste. Again, not the value-added side. The value-added being anything that your customer wants to pay for. You change the market form or function of a product, it's what they're willing to pay for, value-added. Anything else is non-valuated. And we have a necessary non-valuated. There are some things that you're just not gonna get rid of. And uh, I think, uh, Nate, Nathan? You're the accountant guy in here? I told you I was gonna pick on you. So I'm, I'm married to an accountant, so I take advantage of this every now and then. I just get in trouble. Any other accountants in here before I get myself in a whole lot of trouble? Oh, for goodness sakes. We may be doing some work with them too. I better watch my mouth. So, no, it's, we get to the necessary non-value in it. And my, my wife, just, she's been in the financial reporting for a long, long time. I explained, this is something your customers could care less about. So that would be something in my field, my area, non-value added. It did not go over well with my wife, and uh, so I've, I'll do it in little sessions like this, but I try to revise it when I get home, explain, honey, everything you do is just, it's so much value added for me and for the family, it's great. But <laughs> it becomes one of these things, it's, it, if you think about it, and I, I joke about it, do your customers really wanna pay for the fact that you have to get paid, you have to track time, you have to pay somebody else, and not really. That's what we consider, it, but it's a necessary function. It has got to be there. So lean, again, this is the one slide that could identify everything that you guys do, eliminating waste. We've got eight wastes that we identify. Keep in mind these wastes not apply only to the manufacturing side of things, but to the transactional or administrative side of things. We're also seeing these wastes and starting to expand out even further into different industries. I get uh, asked at times, and would this apply to me? Why is it just in manufacturing? Can it be used other places? Actually, we see it in hospital systems now. We're starting to see, uh, in, uh, it's, it's just got a lean accounting program going on, but there's a different way of looking at, program, at, uh, at uh, ledgers and the way you apply costs to particular products. But the waste we see, defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilized people, and my favorite one there, transportation, inventory, motion, and extra processing. And what we see here is typically 99% of all the lead time is something, something that's non-value added. Would we have a, uh, Raw material shows up on the dock today, and it's gonna take two months for it to get out of here. But in that two months to convert that from something that's raw into a finished good, it takes about one day. We got 60 days worth of waste sitting in there. And that's where we see that 90 to 95% of lead time, as we define as one of these eight wastes. Those are the, the, uh, the things that we would be going after to try to make change to. How do we eliminate, reduce, or just completely get rid of them? Again, defects, extra inspections, rework, things like this that you're gonna do. Some of the problems, some of the causes of it, machines not capable, planned maintenance, and just a poorly uh, executed operations out there. But we see waste in everything. We see waste on the transactional side also. If you take orders, you don't get the orders right. Maybe issuing POs, wrong quantity. I wanted 40 and we got an extra zero in there. Hoop, we ordered 400 somehow. This could be a problem. But this is happening everywhere. Overproduction, making more than required, making it earlier, making it faster. We see it again, both sides. Again, do you, do you get a machine set up? You get your processing equipment set up? You get your food processing equipment set up? It's running good, let's just make it. There's some places we go into, people struggle with certain pieces of equipment, and they'll truly do this. They'll just run it and run it and run it, and their thought is, well, we can cook it or we can freeze it, but it'll be good. And they it look for ways to extend the shelf life on it, but they just make way too much. It becomes something that you tie up a lot of money in. You got a finished good sitting in a freezer right now. You've been, to the energy side of things, this is something from working with the guys at ISTC and with Tim, that it, it was something that stuck in my head. You know, I'm thinking, well, you guys make too much of sitting there. You're not re getting the, the revenue off of that. You've got all the money tied up, all your overhead, all your labor, everything is in this, and it's sitting on your property doing nothing. You've paid for everything already. But then you look at the energy cost, with what you guys do in the food and beverage side of things, tremendous energy cost in the, the cooling and freezing of these things. And, uh, and it's sitting there, and it's just chewing it up and eating it up, and there's still money, no money coming in. Overproduction is doing this to you. And some of this we have seen, I, I have been places, and uh, actually with, uh, with the E3 gang that uh, Danny was describing, we've walked into places where they would look in uh, just massive amounts of food, massive amount of finished goods sitting in here, and 
you'd have to go back and find if, if the package was deformed a little bit. Well, that one's probably no good anymore. It's been sitting there for so long, something started to grow inside of this thing and started to expand a little bit. So overproduction, not a good thing. Waiting when a system doesn't work as a whole. In any of your processes, in any of your transactional sides, anybody ever wait for anything at all? Is it just run right smooth? You smooth operation all the way through? Nothing? You're waiting for this, waiting for that. Again, it, it's one of these things, you just look at it, you gotta find a way just to eliminate or reduce it. Because I, I, get, I get frustrated with something like this, and it, it's, it's a, you sit down, you, you wait for people that get you answers. You, you call them, let's wait for the email. And I'm, I'm, I, I guess I, I, there was a guy, I deal, I've got a little piece of rental property, and I found out the best way that I, to, I can uh, communicate with the guy that rents from me is by text messaging. I'm, I got a few years on a few people in here, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm no good at text messaging. <laughs> My fingers don't work like everybody else's, but I found this is the best way to communicate with this guy. I no longer have to wait to talk to this guy. If I send him a message, he gets back to me right away, so I found a way to do it. Look for a way just to reduce that waiting time. Nine utilized personnel people. Uh, again, the waste of not using the people's mental skills, knowledge, and abilities. And again, I think this is just a very important one. It's an asset that we've all got with the people that we work with. And what I'm finding, and maybe other people as you go into different places, or at, at your shops, at your places of business, it is getting more and more difficult to find skilled people that want to stay and do a good job for you. And it is just, uh, to, the, to the, 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 the operation, to the job, to the business that we walk into, that's the first thing that comes out of our mind. Can you help us find somebody? Can you tell us where some skilled people are to get this? And we're actually heading, as an organization, just very quickly, we're looking at, uh, uh, with the NIMEC, one of the charters we have is to keep jobs in Illinois and bring more jobs back to Illinois. But we've reached the point, and this is something coming from our management also, we're starting to look at uh, robotics, quite frankly, in some applications, to where you just can't find people anymore. And for the repetitive jobs, the, 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 the mind-numbing jobs, people are heading down this way. It's, it's to the robotics or another, the thing I went through last couple of weeks is called the uh, cobots or collaborative robots also. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a hand in hand with the human being and the robot to be able to, uh, to take some of the repetitive motion out of things. But people are starting to head this way. But again, it's, it's, I, I'm kind of sad about that to be honest with you because I, I, I like the idea of pulling on these and, and counting on these, this is knowledge and the skills and the abilities of the people that work these jobs. Transportation, transporting parts, materials around the plant, some of the causes, poor plant layout. Uh, Bad process, bad flows. How many of your shops have you got that where you had a new process come in, new piece of equipment come in, and you look for the first open spot on the shop floor, and it gets dropped there? It could be any place. You just, it's just too much to start moving things around. But transportation waste is one of these big things. That uh, is a big opportunity in this when you can start addressing it. Inventory, products not immediately needed to be shipped to the customer. Something in this work in process, it's sitting between processes and then finally finished goods. And then the finished goods is where you want to watch it because that's where all your money's tied up at, sitting at that point. If you could keep it at the lowest or the easiest level of, uh, of uh, it, it would be produced up to a certain point to where it could go many different directions and hold it at that point before you start putting the, the finishing touches on it and then it's gonna sit there and do nothing. One theme as I think about this with uh, everybody that's been presenting here, and it gets around to a lot of what we do with an IMAC, it's got to do with your cash flow. We're looking for ways to shorten lead times and reduce those lead times to where what you pay as it goes out, you get the money coming in on the other end a lot quicker. To the utility side of things, the energy side of, thing, energy side of things, if you can get that cash flowing faster and you can get it through faster, I would imagine, and I, these gentlemen a lot smarter than I am can speak to it, your energy costs start to go down also. And it's just an improvement all the way through. Everybody, they all work together so well. Motion waste, any movement of people and machines that does not add value. And this is just a, a relationship between the operator and the person. Are they having to walk around to the back side, walk around to the front side? And the transactional administrative side, the same type thing. Are you having to, can you find everything on your desk? Are you digging around this? Are you trying to find this? Do you have to go down to the end of the uh, hall to find a copier? Mike, where's the copier in this building? Where do you have to go for that? Right, right here. The front desk. Where's your office at? Okay. <laughs> Long trip, buddy, to get to that copier. But it's, it's, that, it's that, that type of motion. And you know, it's, it's, what's the best place to put it? I wasn't counting on that, Chan, to tell you the truth. I didn't know where that was gonna go. All right, extra non-valuative processing effort that has no value to the product from the customer's point of view. These are things that, and uh, the best example I've got is uh, injection molding. We have people that do quite a bit of this, and they'll run the dye, run the dye, run the dye until it's washed out, or they just, they got bad parting lines, or they got defects in it. Rather than get the dye fixed, 
let's just add an extra process. So we'll add, give somebody a little knife, we'll let them cut all this flash off, we'll let them make it smooth where that's this parting line supposed to be. Six months later, somebody new comes in, let's rebuild the die. Die gets rebuilt, perfect. We got a perfect piece coming out, but in the work instructions or the work process, we still have this knife coming out, let's cut the flash off. So we're opening up the die, pulling the part up, and we're cutting nothing. So what are you doing? It's an extra process that was put in there to help take care of a defect that nobody came around and they didn't complete the circle on it and take it out once it was done. Again, it, this is something we see constantly. People are trying to correct something that was a mistake or a problem or a defect and they put an extra process in place, get it corrected, and then just keep the extra process in place because that's the way we've always done it. So, Those are the eight ways we've got. And again, keep in mind we're looking transactionally or the administrative side and also in the manufacturing side. And it's, it's uh, as I stated earlier, we're getting more and more we're seeing on the administrative or the office side of things. Our lean toolbox, these are things, the tools we've got that we start to combat these weight with, these uh, wastes with. We're looking at stabilizing uh, functions down here, stabilizing tools, standard work, facility layout, batch reduction, quality of the source, 5S, 6S, you guys all familiar with 5S, 6S, workplace organization? Anybody know what the 6S is? 5S plus one? It's the safety aspect of it, so. I got some of my colleagues and I were gonna go write a book come up with a seventh S and sell the book and see what happens with that one. We can make a little money off it. Working in teams, which is very important, that gets back to the knowledge, skills, and abilities, uh, visual controls. I personally have a lot of trouble with a lot of words. If I see a lot of words or I get an email, anybody get these emails that are two pages long? Mm -hmm. How much of it do you read? I get through the second sure, sentence, sure, sure. yeah. <laughs> and then send me a picture, please. <laughs> and just, I, I gotta have something like that. We improvement that we have improvement tools. We talk about tech time, which is just a, it's a demand rate. Do you have enough hours in the day to be able to meet the demand of your customer? Enough working hours there. Working in cells, balancing lines. We have a nice uh, easy flow through it. Quick changeover. Changeover is a big thing in both the office side and in the manufacturing side too. And if you can imagine in your processing operations in food, changing over from one product to the next, how quickly can you do that? A lot of it may be size changes. It may just be packaging changes, and maybe not necessarily the the product that's going through there. But even the big clean outs that you would have, you're changing product to product, they get involved. And the way you need to look at that when you talk about changeovers is getting into the, what's the cost to run that piece of equipment? What's, what's the, the, uh, the run rate for that? What does it cost to my company, my business, to have that machine not running and producing product? You find you can start paying for a whole lot of improvements by understanding what that run rate is on that equipment. Uh, Kanbans are the signals that you've got of when do we need to make something, when do we not need to make something. Point of view storage keeping things close to you. This gets into a, we call it a 30 second rule. In your, your areas of work or your workspaces that you've got, can you find everything that you need to do your job within 30 seconds? Everybody do it? Yeah, I, I can't either, I'm, I'll go look at it. But that's, that's one of these little rules as far as the point of use or, or keep the storage close. If you can get to it within 30 seconds, you're probably doing pretty good. Anything after that, you're probably wasting time trying to find something. And again, it may not sound like much when we're talking seconds or minutes, but over time, like with the money that you're trying to save, it all adds up. If you're looking for 30, 45 seconds, 15, 20 times a day, that number starts to get big at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month. Some of the optimization tools we talk about, we have value stream mapping, which is a great diagnostic tool I'll talk about in a second here. Total productive maintenance, this is predictive productive main, or, uh, predictive and uh, preventive maintenance that we talk about putting in places for equipment. Continuous improvement is the, the foundation of all this. It's something that has to become a way of doing things. And finally, mistake proofing or pokey oak. So quickly, again, quality at the source, it's something that you just need to take time to do it. Spend some time, take a couple extra seconds before something moves on and get it done. The workplace organization, it's the sort, set in order, shine, standardize, sustain. This is one of these things that we do and, and uh, it's, it's a point solution that we've got it happens fast, you can see the dramatic change in two to three days in a particular process or an operation. The hard part as we get into these, these five S's, the first three are easy to do. The sort, set in order, and shine. Very easy to do, get done day in, day and a half. Uh, standardized, we, standard, we put processes together to sustain the first three S's. The hard part is the fifth S, the sustain. This is where the discipline comes into place and it becomes a way of doing things. You have to change the way you actually think about doing things. And it's difficult. Now with these guys in the, in, the, in the food and beverage industry, as far as the cleanup, you pretty much have to do it. You have no choice because of what you do. And it's gonna be there. Other manufacturing environments, it gets more difficult. I got a little sustained problem in my basement right now. I don't know about anybody else, about 
I cleaned it up when we moved in five years ago. It's time to <laughs> throw everything out again, start over. Working in teams, again, just uh, quickly on that, many minds working together much better than just the one. Again, there's so many diverse experiences, so many different experiences people have, take advantage of it. Visual controls, simple signals that provide the immediate understanding of a situation or a condition. Can you walk by something, take a look at it, and know what it is? Know what the problem is, know what the condition is. Is it working good, not working good? Some of the uh, examples, we have Kanban cards or just signal cards for storage locations. Do you need to produce, do you not need to produce? Color-coded dyes, tools, palettes. Uh, as you put some of your processing equipment together, do you know how they're joined together? Or are you just kind of guessing as you put one piece to next to the other piece? Lines on the floors, lines on the racks, where you put them at. Finally, these andon lights, these are very visual ones. It's on top of a lot of processing equipment in all industries I've seen it. It's the, the red light, the yellow light, the white light, the green light. The red, you're down, the white light, you're probably idling, green, you're running, the yellow, hey, we're gonna have a problem. But it's a very visual thing that you can see. Uh, batch size reduction we talk about, going from large batches to smaller batches. The, the quick version of this is if you produce, we've got going through process A, it's taken 10 minutes to do process A. 10 minutes process B, 10 minutes process C. We take process A plus process B, we got 20 minutes tied up in it. The first good piece is gonna come off at 21 minutes where we're gonna find out if we have a problem with it. If we do have a problem because we're working in batches, we got 20 other pieces we have to correct. Versus a one piece flow, which is where a lot of the continuous improvement lean manufacturing people will take you to go. And again, keep in mind this one piece flow is nothing more than a goal to get to. In my 20 plus years of doing just this type of work, I've been in one operation that I've seen a true one piece flow. But the one place in, in, in itself is make one, move one, make one, move one. Go to process A, to process B, to process C, and you end up at three minutes plus, you've got the first part coming out versus 21 minutes. You complete the whole order in 12 minutes versus 30 plus minutes. This is the impact of reducing batch sizes. Now with people processing food, I know you try to get things set up and run as much as possible, or there's some minimums that you really need to do based on what you're trying to produce. All I would suggest in something like that is try to reduce things down. You're never gonna get the one piece flow. It makes no sense, which is I think of that, some of these tools we're talking about just don't make sense, and you don't need to apply everything that you've got. Value stream layout, plant layout. Uh, the top is just a typical by department layout. The bottom gets into a value stream layout where you're producing and running pro by product family through the processes. You would like to streamline as much as possible. Difficult to do in existing plants. They asked the question about the, the HVAC on new construction. There's a plant that I'm working with down south and we've gone through this exercise with them, but it's a brand new plant. And we put value stream flows into this thing and these people are pretty good at it. If we can help them with the HVAC, that would be even better too. So, But uh, again, this is one of those things, it's very hard to do in an existing plant. But it's one of those things you just kind of keep it in the back of your mind, how can I flow better through these processes? Standard work, work period, I consistently with tasks organized the best known sequence of people, materials, machines, and methods. And standard work is a very powerful tool. If you can do things the same way over and over again, you get repeatability, you start to have problems with something, you can typically find out where it's at. Every one of these shops of the people in here, you're all standardized, everything's documented, everybody every, does everything the same way. Is that yes, no? Everybody's got their own best method of doing things, quite frankly. With that, we, as we start working with standard work with people, we tell them, let's get the whole group involved with this. Let's get the best practices from everybody and try to come up with some, some type of consistent way to do this that everybody's comfortable with. But standard work is just a very powerful tool within the lean world. Uh, tack time, this German word for rhythm or drum beat. All it basically is is it tells you, do you have enough time to meet the demand of your customer? Is there enough production time in your shop to meet the demand of your customer? This is a uh, study we work with, or a, a part of our workshop. We've got effective working time I, uh, divided by the custom rate. The effective working time is 60 seconds times 20 minutes. Uh, it's a 20 minute round we use. For those that have been through this lean 101 thing that we do, there's 115 units you're supposed to produce in, in those 20 minutes. So you've got 6,400 seconds, so, so 1,200 seconds. The math I can't do in my head. <laughs> we have 60 times 120 divided by 115 we got 10.4 seconds, which what this means is every 10.4 seconds, this finished board that we make has to come off the end of the line to meet the demand of the customer. A real life example, and this has got a little bit dated to it, but with Toyota several, uh, three or four years ago now, I think they had two lines next to each other, but their tack time was 55 seconds. Every 55 seconds, a car was coming off the end of the line, and that was meeting the demand of their customer that they had to throw, it was uh, within the United States at this time. It was a, a domestic plant. 
but this every 55 seconds is coming out. And people look at that and they think, my God, how can that be? 55 seconds to build a car. The thing you need to remember, there may have been 2,000 stations, workstations, but each one was set up at 55 seconds. So every 55 seconds, something was moving along. It may have taken a couple weeks to fill that line, but at the end, every 55 seconds they're dropping off because that was what Toyota deemed the amount of time they had to produce a car to meet the demand of their customers. Okay. Cellular layout, again, a lot of what you guys do within the food industry, it is cellular. You got something's coming in, raw meat coming in, or raw protein, raw, protein, right? I keep calling it meat and I apologize for that. Protein coming in and a packaged good coming out the other end. You guys just, they're inherently in cells within the food and the beverage industry. Changeover, time between the last good piece off the current run, the first good piece off the next run. I'd mentioned changeover earlier. Very important concept. Not only does it give you, it, 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 as you reduce them, you start to get more capacity out of the processes. You become able to quickly respond to the demands of your customers, to change your customers. Nobody, does your customer ever change orders on you midway through? Nobody ever changes anything. Perfect. You guys get to start it and end it without a change. That's uh, good luck with that. But again, the, the, the changeover thing, is it's, it's a very powerful tool. Can ban the communication signal. Again, it's something, it does it. Do we have it, do we not have it? If we don't have it here, let's make it. It's a visual thing. Depending on the size of your plant and your operation, it may be something electronic. Um, I'm a big proponent of heading towards uh, as much automation as possible as far as tracking and, and, and watching orders, watching processes. It's just that uh, this visual thing, it, it becomes very easy just to set yourself up, depending on the size of the shop, the plant, to walk through and just see what's there. And just that, again, that quick visual, yeah, we need to produce, no, we don't need to produce this. Point of view storage, talked about a bit, that 30 second rule at the bottom here, can you get to it? It is something, and again, sometimes people struggle with this, it, it, can you, does that really make that much difference? And just to express it once again, if you can pick up 10, 15, 20 seconds every time you perform something, and it just adds up over the day, over the week, over the month. You pick up a day, you pick up a week. Uh, it just takes time to get there. You don't see the big impact. So you have to be patient with these programs also. And finally, value stream mapping. Value stream mapping is the place that we actually start with these things. It's a diagnostic tool that you get into where you look at the process from start to finish, from receipt of order to shipment of product. We look at a high level what each process has going into it. We define, or I would define a process by having a pile of something here, you do something to it, and a pile of something over here. There's a process in between there. We put this map together, it's typically a one page look at the uh, process for product group or for a complete process, for a complete operation. And with the metrics and who's the base, there was a baseline person in here, which we have to baseline this process because it's very important to start that way. And Shen is right about that. As we baseline, we look at certain metrics going through here, we find out where our difficulties are at. Once we identify where our waste is at or difficulties, we then start getting into our lean toolbox and apply those tools to it. That's why it's a great diagnostic tool and it gives you a roadmap to move forward with. PPM, or total productive maintenance, productive predictive maintenance. Uh, and it's one of those things, it's another tool to keep the equipment up and running. It, uh, if you don't have, um, and I, I, I'm guilty of this, I started out 100 years ago in a steel mill and our method of running was run till it quit. Then we'll just, we'll fix it when it's done. You know, it, it's been running for 60 hours straight. We got some, we got no oil going to the bearings and they're melting on us. What should we do? Keep running until it stops. That was the methodology. That was the way of thinking back then. And it just makes no sense. It is hard at times to shut something down. To the predictive side, predictive maintenance, it, it's a difficult portion. I've told a story and I, it's a quick one here. It's, I, I had a, a 1991 Nissan Maxima, brand new car I bought and then had it for several years, but it had a timing belt on it that was a fiber timing belt and at 60,000 miles, it's recommended that you replace that timing belt. Okay, I go to the dealer, so I'm hitting 60,000 miles. 600 bucks, Rick, 600 bucks for that thing? He said, yep, no problem. I said, I, I, I don't wanna spend that. I said, what happens if it breaks? You destroy your engine, and that's $3,000. But it was hard for me to take that and have, then spend that 600 bucks just to fix something that was working just fine, just in case it might break. That's the predictive side of things and of, uh, of TPM. And again, it's a tough one to do, but uh, it's just a different way of thinking and, and uh, working. Deming cycle continues improvement as we work through these things, the, the plan, do, check, act. Again, it's something, it's we do it, it applies to almost everything that we do. One little thing I always like to put in down here at the bottom, uh, it, and Deming came up with this, and I've always find this interesting, and I remind my leaders in Peoria about this every now and then. 94% of the problems and defects are caused by the systems and not by the individuals. 
And it's something that uh, as you start looking at it and starting understanding the way things operate, you start seeing that it's a system problem, typically, and not with the people. Poker yoke, mistake proofing, again, just ways to not do it wrong. The best example is the three prong plug. It can only go in one way, and then we're done. It, it's again, or you can do what I do, and you take a pliers and pull that little pole off, and then it fits just fine. <laughs> in conclusion, lean, it's simple and visual. The traditional way of operating is complex. Demand driven versus forecast driven. Inventory is needed versus the excess inventory, making too much. Reduces the non-value added, and the traditional side, you speed up the value added side of it. Again, the, the, but that's a small portion of the total lead time. Small light, small lot versus batch production. Minimal lead time versus long leads. Uh, quality built, quality inspected in on the traditional side. And finally, value stream managers versus functional departments. The value stream manager would have a product group from start to finish. Questions? It's a great thing. Try it. Okay, thank you very much.